Chapter twenty three of Adeline Mowbray by Amelia Alderson Opie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pam Moscato. Chapter twenty three. Savannah was going to remonstrate, but the words short remainder of my days distressed her so much that tears choked her words, and she obeyed in silence her mistress's orders to pack up, except when she indulged in a few exclamations against her lady's cruelty in going away without taking leave of colonel mordaunt who sweet gentleman would break his heart at her departure especially as he was not to know whither she was going a post-chaise was at the door the next morning at six o'clock and as adeline had not much luggage having left the chief part of her furniture to be divided between the mistresses of her two lodgings in return for their kind attention to her and her child she took an affectionate leave of her landlady and desired the post-boy to drive a mile on the road before him, and when he had done so, she ordered him to go on to Barnet, while the disappointed mulatto thanked God that the tawny boy was gone to Scotland with his protectress, as it prevented her having the mortification of leaving him behind her, as well as the colonel. "'Oh, had I such a lover,' cried she, her eyes filling with tears, "'me never leave him, nor he me,' and for the first time she thought her angel lady hard-hearted." for some miles they proceeded in silence for adeline was too much engrossed to speak and the little editha being fast asleep in the mulatto's arms did not draw her mother out of the reverie into which she had fallen and where now said the mulatto when the chaise stopped to the next stage on the high north road and on they went again nor did they stop except for refreshments till they had travelled thirty miles when adeline worn out with fatigue stayed all night at the inn where the chaise stopped and the next morning they resumed their journey but not their silence the mulatto could no longer restrain her curiosity and she begged to know whither they were going and why they were to be buried in the country adeline sighing deeply answered that they were going to live in cumberland and then sunk into silence again as she could not give the mulatto her true reasons for the plan that she was pursuing without wounding her affectionate heart in a manner wholly incurable the truth was that adeline supposed herself to be declining she thought that she experienced those dreadful languors those sensations of internal weakness which however veiled to the eye of the observer speak in forcible language to the heart of the conscious sufferer indeed adeline had long struggled but in vain against feelings of a most overwhelming nature amongst which remorse and horror for having led by her example the precepts and innocent girl into a life of infamy were the most painfully predominant for believing mary warner's assertion when she saw her at mr langley's chambers she looked upon that unhappy girl's guilt as the consequence of her own and mourned incessantly mourned over the fault errors of her early judgment which had made her though an indolator of virtue a practical assistant to the cause of vice when Adeline imagined the term of her existence to be drawing nigh, her mother, her obdurate but still dear mother, regained her wonted ascendancy over her affections, and to her the approach of death seemed fraught with satisfaction. For that parent so long, so repeatedly deaf to her prayers, and to the detail of those sufferings which she had made one of the conditions of her forgiveness, had promised to see and to forgive her on her deathbed, and her heart yearned, fondly yearned, for the moment when she should be pressed to the bosom of a relenting parent to cumberland therefore she was resolved to hasten and into the very neighborhood of mrs mowbray while as the chaise wheeled them along to the place of their destination even the prattle of her child could not always withdraw her from the abstraction into which she was plunged as the scenes of her early years thronged upon her memory and with them the recollection of those proofs of a mother's fondness from a renewal of which even in the society of glenmurray she had constantly and despondingly sighed as they approached penrith her emotion redoubled as she involuntarily exclaimed cruel but still dear mother you little think your child is so near heaven save me cried savannah are we to go and be near dat woman yes replied adeline did she not say she would forgive me on my deathbed but you are not there yet, dear mistress, sobbed Savannah. You're not there of long years. Savannah, returned Adeline, I should die contented to purchase my mother's blessing and forgiveness. 
savannah speechless with contending emotions could not express by words the feeling of mixed sorrow and indignation which overwhelmed her but she replied by putting editha in adeline's arms then articulating with effort look there she sobbed aloud i understand you said adeline kissing away the tears gathering on editha's eyes at sight of savannah's distress but perhaps i think my death would be of more service to my child than my life and to me too i suppose cried savannah reproachfully well me go to scotland for no one love me but the tawny boy you first will stay and close my eyes i hope observed adeline mournfully in a moment savannah's resentment vanished me will live and die vid you she replied her tears redoubling while adeline again sunk into thoughtful silence as soon as they reached penrith adeline inquired for lodgings out of the town on that side nearest to her mother's abode and was so fortunate as she esteemed herself to procure two apartments at a small house within two miles of mrs mowbray's then i breathe once more the same air with my mother exclaimed adeline as she took possession of her lodging savannah methinks i breathe freer already me more choked replied the mulatto and turned sullenly away nay i i feel so much better that to-morrow i will i will take a walk said adeline hesitantly and where asked savannah eagerly oh to-night i shall only walk to bed replied adeline smiling and with unusual cheerfulness she retired to rest the next morning she arose early and being informed that a stile near a peasant's cottage commanded a view of mrs mowbray's house she hired a man and cart to convey her to the bottom of the hill and with editha by her side she set out to indulge her feelings by gazing on the house which contained her mother when they alighted editha gaily endeavored to climb the hill and urged her mother to follow her but adeline rendered weak by illness and breathless by emotion felt the ascent so difficult that no motive less powerful than the one which actuated her could have enabled her to reach the summit at length however she did reach it and the lawn before mrs mowbray's white house her hayfields the running stream at the bottom of it burst in all their beauty on her view and this is my mother's dwelling exclaimed adeline and there was i born and near here shall i die she would have added but her voice failed her oh what a pretty house and garden cried editha in the unformed accents of childhood how i should like to live there this artless remark awakened a thousand mixed and overpowering feelings in the bosom of adeline and after a pause of strong emotion she exclaimed catching the little prattler to her heart you shall live there my child yes yes you shall live there but when resumed editha when i am in my grave answered adeline and when shall you be there replied the unconscious child fondly caressing her pray mamma pray be there soon adeline turned away unable to answer her look look mamma resumed editha there are ladies oh do let us go there now why can't we would to god we could replied adeline as in one of the ladies she recognized mrs mowbray and stood gazing on her till eyes ached again but what she felt on seeing her she will herself describe in the succeeding pages and i shall only add that soon as mrs mowbray returned to the house adeline wrapped in a long and mournful reverie returned full of a new plan to her lodgings there is no love so disinterested as parental love and adeline had all the keen sensibilities of a parent to make therefore assurance doubly sure that mrs mowbray should receive and should love her orphan when she was no more she resolved to give up the gratification to which she had looked forward the hope before she died of obtaining her forgiveness that she may not weaken by directing any part of them to herself those feelings of remorse fruitless tenderness and useless regret in her mother's bosom which she wished should be concentrated in her child no said adeline to herself i am sure that she will not refuse to receive my orphan to her love and protection when i am no more and am become alike insensible of reproaches and of blessings and i think that she will love my child the more tenderly because to me she will be unable to express the compunction which sooner or later she will feel from the recollection of her conduct towards me therefore i will make no demands on her love for myself but in a letter to be given her after my decease bequeath my orphan to her care and with this determination 
she returned from her ride have you seen her cried savanna running out to meet her yes but not spoken to her nor shall i see her again what i suppose she see you and not speak oh no she did not see me nor shall i urge her to see me my plans are altered replied adeline and we go back to town and colonel mordaunt no resumed adeline sighing deeply and preparing to write to mrs mowbray but it is necessary that we should for a short time go back to berrendale and relate that while adeline and editha were confined to the smallpox mr drury received a summons from his employer in jamaica to go over thither to be entrusted with some particular business in consequence of this he resolved to call again on adeline and inquire whether she still persisted in styling herself mrs berrendale as he concluded that berrendale would be very glad of all the information relative to her and her child which he could possibly procure whether his curiosity on the subject proceeded from fear or love it so happened that as soon as editha as well as her mother was in the height of the disorder mr drury called and finding that they were both very bad he thought that his friend berrendale was likely to get rid of both his encumbrances at once and being eager to communicate good news to a man whose influence in the island might be of benefit to him he every day called to inquire concerning their health the second floor in the house where adeline lodged was then occupied by a young woman in indigent circumstances who as well as her child had sickened with the distemper the very day that editha was inoculated and when drury just as he was setting off for portsmouth ran to gain the last intelligence of the invalids a charwoman who attended to the door not being acquainted with the name of the poor young woman and her little girl concluded that mr drury by mrs berrendale and miss who were ill with the smallpox meant them replied to his inquiries ah poor things it is all over with them they died last night on which not staying for any further intelligence drury set off for portsmouth and arrived at jamaica just as berrendale was going to remit to adeline a draft for a hundred pounds for adeline and the injury which he had done her had been for some days constantly present to his thoughts he had been ill and as indigestion the cause of his complaints is apt to occasion disturbed dreams he had in his dreams been haunted by the image of glenmurray who with a threatening aspect had reproached him with cruelty and base ingratitude to him in deserting in such a manner the wife whom he had bequeathed to him the constant recurrence of these dreams had depressed his spirits and excited his remorse so much that he could calm his feelings in no other way than by writing a kind letter to adeline and enclosing her a draft on his banker this letter was on the point of being sent when drury arrived and with very little ceremony informed him that adeline was dead dead exclaimed berrendale falling almost senseless on his couch dead oh for god's sake tell me of what she died surely surely she here his voice failed him drury coolly replied that she and her child both died of the smallpox but when my dear fellow when say that they died nine months ago that was previous to his marriage and you make me your friend for life drury so bribed would have said anything and with all the coolness possible he replied then be my friend for life they died rather better than nine months ago berrendale being then convinced that bigamy was not likely to be proved against him soon forgot in the joy this thought occasioned him remorse for his conduct to adeline and regret for her early fate besides he concluded that he saved one hundred pounds by the means for he knew not that the delicate mind of adeline would have scorned to owe pecuniary obligations to the husband who had basely and unwarrantably deserted her but he was soon undeceived on this subject by a letter which colonel mordaunt wrote in confidence to a friend in jamaica begging him to inquire concerning mr berrendale's second marriage and to inform him privately that his injured wife had zealous and powerful friends in england who were continually urging her to prosecute him for bigamy this intelligence had a fatal effect on the health of berrendale for though the violent temper and overbearing disposition of his second wife had often made him regret the gentle and compliant adeline and a separation from her consequently would be a blessing still he feared to encounter the disgrace of a prosecution and still more the anger of his west indian wife who it was not improbable might even attack his life in the first moment of ungoverned passion 
and to these fears he soon fell a sacrifice for a frame debilitated by intemperance could not support the assaults made on it by the continued apprehensions which colonel mordaunt's friend had excited in him and he died in that gentleman's presence whom in his last moments he had summoned to his apartment to witness a will by which he owned adeline mowbray to be his lawful wife and left editha his acknowledged and only heir a very considerable fortune but this circumstance an account of which with the will was transmitted to colonel mordaunt did not take place till long after adeline took up her abode in cumberland End of chapter twenty three recording by pam moscato